great to see you or um should i say as in the film hey there he is because you there say he that is, lot. <laughs> i'm so glad you got to see the film nobody's seen it yet basically apart from like a few crowds of people it's been uh it's been kind of quiet and private i'm glad that you've been able to check it out i am very privileged then so thank you very much uh -oh, because... yeah. Yeah. You okay yeah um because i mean last time we spoke everything was yeah you're frozen under wraps. okay now i can see it now I can see it. okay everything was under wraps last time and you couldn't really talk about it and i sort of held you to a promise that when you could talk about it you would and now we can because i've seen the film and of course the reason why um you couldn't really talk about it was because uh, it's a satire on the dispute between the Rice Guild of America and the big Hollywood agencies. Can you give us a bit of background on that? Yeah, sure. So uh, the agencies in Hollywood were trying to breach contracts or find loopholes in contracts that they had made in the 1920s and 30s that stipulated that they weren't able to be producers of content. They just had to represent um, their client. And a few years ago, they started to try and work around that because they realized that producing content is the real way to make money. By owning the work, it's the real way to be able to make stuff um, and make a living. So in order to continue to grow these agencies, they decided to try to break through these contracts and start these producing arms that were separate companies that would basically change their clients from the agents being the employees of the client to flip it so that the clients were all subordinates to the agency world. It was, it was, it would be as though like, they were trying to create studios out of the agencies by using their clout and bullying tactics um, to, to make way and headway in Hollywood. It was criminal. And the Writers Guild of America put up this fight saying, no, that's bullshit. That is not how art should be made. They didn't have to put up this fight, but they did. And very recently they won. And all of the agencies have had to sign um, to be signatories to the WGA contract saying that um, only a certain percentage of the stuff that they're doing, they're able to produce and also um, that it would be the end of packaging, which is kind of what the film is about. So during this war, we were seeing all these articles in every media outlet about this thing, but I was never, like, it was such a toxic subject to talk about, and everybody knew about it, but nobody felt comfortable talking about it because they were terrified of the powers that be. And my buddy PJ and I were like, well, that's really funny. Why don't we, like, like, I didn't even see, like, a sketch about it. There was, like, nobody was, everybody was, like, dead silent about it. And I was like, all right, well, why don't we start doing it? And so we, we started writing this movie kind of in secret. We had the idea for the anonymous sexual letter, letter service. And then we knew that that movie was going to be about lying and dishonesty. And so we're like, perfect. We can also make it about Hollywood because, you know, those two go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, you can't do one without the other. Um, and so uh, we started writing it. And then in doing so, we realized we were hitting these roadblocks of not knowing exactly what it was like on the inside. And so I tweeted one day and said, um, I'd be interested in talking to assistants and agents and managers and stuff to kind of find out what's going on. I had to delete the tweet because I got so many people reaching out. I'd be like, oh my God, my roommate is, a, is an assistant at this big place. And eventually we, we met up with like probably seven people in person. And then we had these long form email correspondence and phone calls with other people. Two of them were leakers, but then everybody else was just really excited that somebody was finally talking about the thing. And, uh, it was really good. It was, it was, that was kind of how the, the, the screenplay was finished, was doing all of this, you know, year and a half of research about what, what it was actually like on the inside. And I gather some of the things that you were actually told have, have ended up in the dialogue. Is that right? Yeah. So the scene of me shouting at my assistant, Jacqueline, there's only one sentence that's different from verbatim. And uh, we got that testimony from an assistant at one of the top four agencies in Hollywood and when we shot it I realized I hadn't checked with this person the source um, and I said we actually used it almost entirely verbatim and I'm nervous that the person that shouted it might remember and the source said he'll never remember that he'll never remember that he said that because it just happens all the time these people are insane um, and we found that to be pretty funny. Yeah, it was, uh, there's a lot of it that we built in through the testimony and through just like email correspondences of terms of phrase, euphemism, things like that, that ended up in the film. So I remember you telling me last time that you had shown it to some people in the industry. Now, presumably you've shown it to more people since. 
What's the reaction been like? Has the reaction changed since the initial screenings? What's amazing is when people who have been in the film industry see it, they guffaw and kind of cringe. And it's this kind of like comedy of like, oh my God, I can't believe they're doing this. It feels like showing somebody an episode of South Park or something. Um, <laughs> But then it can often sometimes trigger people in a negative way of like, I was an assistant at CAA or I was an assistant at this place. And like, that was that experience. And like, I have this PTSD that I carry along with me for the rest of my life because of this boss that I had um, who was an agent. Um, and so it's been really cathartic, I think, for people. And obviously it's a, goof, it's a goofy comedy as well as a horror movie. So like, I think we were always towing the line of, you know, making sure that it was, it was coming from a way of supporting the people who are down and out in the film industry, like us. Um, and so I think overall, the vast majority of people are going to like it. I don't think agents will, but I think all of their clients might, which is, uh, which is quite nice. <laughs> Doesn't show agents in a very good light, I've got to say. I mean, jo Jordan's absolutely hideous. He's horrible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he He's really awful. is. And that, that scene where he tells and, off his assistants is just awful. Yeah, that's verbatim from uh, an agent talking to his assistant at uh, one of the top four agencies in Hollywood in 2019. So like wow. relatively recently. It's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. One, one of the things that occurred to me when I was watching the film was because it's such a, an insider's view, I wondered if you felt that it would turn out to be an insider's film and that might actually mean that it would limit your audience. Um, there was always that nervousness about inside baseball, but I mean, all of my favorite movies are about very specific subjects that are well, you know, researched. I think like In the Loop or, um, or Veep, it could be seen as inside baseball of working in the White House or something, but I find it so interesting because you get to learn a new language, you can see what that world is like and how ridiculous it is. And then also broadly, the movie is like this erotic thriller comedy which are like two non-overlapping audiences that are already enormous and you know we made the movie for perverts and there's no shortage of them so i think <laughs> i think we'll be i think we'll be fine <laughs> oh that's gonna go on the poster a movie for perverts <laughs> <laughs> there is there is though a moment in the film when uh, the dreadful jordan in his usual manner is um he's on the phone to it I think it's an independent filmmaker and asks him, how much longer do you want to keep making something that nobody's watching? And I did actually wonder if maybe you were getting a little bit of your own back. <laughs> yes, but also I love that. I say like TV is the future. There's so much larger of an audience than television. I mean, how much longer, like so much larger of an audience than independent film, how much longer do you want to keep making movies that nobody is seeing? And it was a bit of me being like, I was getting pushed into doing television, but also it's such a funny joke against the agencies because anybody who's watching the movie is watching an independent film. So it's like, <laughs> exactly. it's just, it, it works for that audience, it's great. <laughs> and indeed you, you have um, built quite a reputation for yourself as, how should I say, the most independent of independent filmmakers. How do you think you'd react if one of the big studios came calling? I mean, assuming that they haven't already. I don't have the small studios come and knocking on my door. Like, I, I, I think really it's just me and it's me and my small team at Vanishing Angle. And it's a bit like a summer camp anytime we make a movie where it's the same crowd of people. We come back and start making stuff. And it's a really wonderful way to grow from smaller projects like short films to expand to making features. And looking at someone like Kerry Fukunaga or, you know, Destin Cretton or kind of any of these people who are heroes of mine who started out making shorts and then indie features and then have grown, um, I'd love to, but nobody's taken it seriously in Hollywood. And so that's kind of why we made the movie making fun of them. I don't know. It's like, They're just being I, I think slow. It, They're just being slow. <laughs> maybe. I hope so. I have, I, have, I have bigger movies. And actually, the people at Netflix and Hulu really loved the movie they saw it at Berlinale and they were like this is the best movie at the festival like we got to find something so it's possible that I make a bigger movie in the future I'd love to um but as of now I'm really enjoying the complete freedom of making you know uncomfortable movies that make people laugh which is kind of a luxury really it's great it's so freeing yeah it's especially now we're like I think we're in this 
generational shift towards more sanitized filmmaking. And it's great to not have to do that. I, I got final cut on this movie. I got to spend 16 months doing the sound effects and uh, edit of the film that never happens in Hollywood. I've been, yeah, I, I, I put the stamp of my own stamp on this film. This is something that I, it came from my heart and I was able to finish it entirely with my own two hands. And that rarely happens. So if another studio, regardless of size, came calling, how reluctant would you be to give that up? It depends on the project. I mean, like, and then I'm realizing more and more in talking with bigwigs in Hollywood that they rely on our best practices. So if I say we don't need a 50 person crew, we need a 15 person crew, they usually listen. It's like, all right, well, you know, the guys made three movies and they all have good grades on Rotten Tomatoes. So like um, maybe we should maybe we should start playing in his sandbox instead of the one that we're used to. Um, I, I don't know. People have people might think that they're reluctant to change, but a lot of the executives that I've spoken to have been relatively cool about not pulling punches and doing stuff that audiences like rather than what studios do. That would be amazing. Now, of course, we're um, we're talking on the the eve of the beta tests UK premiere. Uh, yeah. It's sold out at Edinburgh. Yeah. It's absolutely yeah. sold out, um, and I believe that's not the first time it's happened because th didn't that happen at Tribeca as well? It happened at Tribeca and it happened at Berlinale, and they both sold out in like an hour. I mean, I think also kind of with, with everybody being vaccinated at these festivals now it's people are just dying to get out to the cinema to have the cinematic experience. And um, yeah, we've been very lucky. Like that's, that's something that is a product of the world right now and not necessarily interest in our stupid indie film, but- uh, Well, I was gonna yeah, ask I'll you that. It. I mean, do you, do you think not? Do you, do you think that um, doesn't actually know. reflect I mean, an I think... interest in, in, in your type of filmmaking and independent films as a whole? Oh, I think so. And I think people are, I mean, you see it all the time on social media. People are getting sick of stuff that is made that is just very generic or made by an algorithm rather than, you know, something that's handmade. And I think also there is this desire to see something that's very new that is being made by someone who is not pinned down by the system. And so a lot of times, with young filmmakers, they look up to me as like, oh, I want to be like that guy because I, I can't be like any of these bigger people. Um, in the same way that I looked up to people like Trey Schultz, where it's like, you know, I was first in line to see Waves because it was the first time he got like a real budget to make anything. And it's like, oh man, I can't wait to see what, what Trey did. And um, wasn't that worth you know. saying? Oh my God. It's crazy amazing. to see it on the big screen. It's yeah. amazing. It's yeah. such a beautiful film. It's so touching, so heartbreaking. Um, and partially autobiographical, which is crazy. Yeah, that kind of fusion, I realized with the Thunder Road short of like, when I, when I was making a movie as a writer, actor, and director, it was a different audience experience than when I was producing for just directors and writers, where when people see me humiliating myself on screen, they're, they're saying, oh no, he planned all of this. He was purposely yeah. trying to make himself look bad <laughs> in this parking lot screaming match. Um, <laughs> And there's this like appreciation, almost like Jackie Chan or something. It's like, oh, he's, he's getting the shit kicked out of him in this scene, but he wrote this scene and did the choreography for it. So it's like, I don't know. I feel like there's a deeper appreciation for people like Jackie Chan or Buster Keaton or Lena Dunham or me that people feel this closeness of like, oh, well, I have to see what he's going to do next in this really wonderful way. I love it. <laughs> can, I, can I put in a plea, please? And that is that we have the, the, the beta test at the London Film Festival in October. Because I know so I many that. people I'm, want to see it. So our, our distributors are really wonderful. And I'm coming out in October for the theatrical release. So I don't know if we're in the program at London, but at the very least, we should be at the Prince Charles. And uh, we get to hang out and have a pint and watch movies. Yes, absolutely. That. <laughs> yes. Okay, <Hooray>. cool. <laughs> It'd be so nice to meet face to face again anyway, whatever. Oh, that would be fantastic. I know. You, and you know me. I know. Home. I realize. <laughs> okay, good. Good, good, good. I realize I haven't had that experience in a long time of like sitting in the movie theater lobby and talking about movies. And I miss it so much. Like that was, that was my society. That was like me learning about movies and stuff. And yeah, I haven't had that for a year and a half now. Crazy. So what, uh, what comes next after the beta test? 
there I asked. Oh my God. Oh my God. I just wrote my buddy PJ, who's the co-writer and co-director of Beta Test, uh, and our buddy Dustin Hahn just wrote a feature that we delivered to our team that we were going to go out for sale with about a YouTube journalist getting the scoop of a century. And it's really funny and really beautiful. And it's called David Tonight. And he runs this like news program out of his garage with the help of his mom. And it's so touching and so funny. And I really want to do that one because it's smaller budget and we could do it um, relatively quickly and safely in COVID. Um, but th that I think will probably be next. And then PJ and I are writing something that's a Victorian horror film, but strangely, that I, I guess the next two movies, neither of us act in. It would just be us writing and directing. Um, wow. So yeah, very, very interesting pivot. That, but that would um, be, be a change it, for you. Because I mean, normally you write, direct, and you're in front of the camera as well. Yeah. And so I think, I think with maturity uh, comes wanting to separate a bit from... <laughs> from the film and just and just craft I work on craftsmanship I realize like there are times when I'm on set and I'm distracted memorizing lines or taking my clothes off in a parking lot that like I get distracted from the directing aspect of it and I want to do that and so I think the next few films that we're going to do are going to be a bit more meticulous like uh, Parasite or something like that. So is that how you see the, the future Panning out, or certainly in the short term, more more directing and writing than acting. I think so. I think it's what I'm good at. I think like it's something that I can do, obviously during quarantine, um, and so I really enjoy it, um, writing stuff and making people laugh. And I think in the future I might be doing that a bit more of reading other people's scripts and seeing how I can do it. Like I, I got so jealous of seeing that picture of Alfred Hitchcock, his birthday was recently, and he has a stack of all these movies that he made. He oh, made like yeah, 75 yeah, films or something, yeah. 100 films. Yeah, like I saw that. that picture. And um, yeah. yeah, and it's like, my God, I wish, and, and you know, he was Alfred Hitchcock. He had such like a unique style and was making a movie a year, two movies a year or something like that. And um, I'm jealous of that. I think, I think I'd, I'd like to do more instead of spending time um, memorizing lines. And in that vein, of course, you could still do a little cameo in all of your films. <laughs> yeah, I have a I have a nice cameo. Yeah, that's true. I could be <laughs> I could be in the background. Um, I have to yeah. put on some serious weight and put on a suit and then just be yeah, out. Don't, don't put weight weapons. on. No, 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 no. <laughs> just just a little cameo so that it becomes a trademark. <laughs> okay, cool. I'll do that. I'll appear <laughs> in the background of all these things. Um, but yeah, I I think that might be the future for me. I'd like to I'd like to do more of that. There's really only one other part that is outside of the cinematic universe that we've created so far, an acting part that I've written that I think I'd like to do before I die. That would be this like kids adventure movie. But maybe, maybe Netflix will come knocking and say, hey, we'd like to do this thing. And then oh, I get yeah. to do that and rest easy. Yeah, you never know. Now, presumably you're still keeping up with your British comedy because you, you love that. As yeah, well. yeah. Oh God, the new season of Alan Partridge this time. And they shot another one. They shot a new season, yeah. uh, a second season in October. I haven't seen any of it yet. I don't know if it's come out. Um, I've, I've but... saw some of the the new season of Alan Partridge. The one I wanted to ask you about, see if you've seen it. Have you watched Ted Lasso? I have. Um, my buddy Brett Goldstein is in that is in that series. He plays the like hard ass. Guy. I know, I know really who Brett good. Goldstein is. <laughs> Yeah, he's really great. Because what I like about Ted Lasso, one of the things I like about Ted Lasso is the way that it fuses American and British comedy together and does it so yeah. well. Yeah, it's really wonderful. Yeah, to, to infuse American accents and like having Americans sometimes be the straight man um, is really is really funny. It works naturally. It's great. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful series. It's gone down huge over here. Everybody Good. It has here it. too. Yeah, so, my whole family got me into it. They're like, it, well, it was on the front page of like Apple and iTunes for six months or something like that. It became this like cultural phenomenon over here. Well, we're in season two at the moment. In fact, it's Friday tomorrow, so that's Ted Lasso Day because that's when the next episode comes out. <laughs> Friday afternoons, right. I always have to watch Ted Lasso you, once I've done something. You've planned your week based on the Oh, yeah, and totally. Stuff. Yeah. Totally. I am that sad. Yeah. I have to say, I, I absolutely adore Brett Goldstein's character, right? Uh, yeah. Boy, sorry. Yeah. Which is so crazy because he's such a nice dude in real life. Like I met him at South by Southwest in like 2017, 2016 maybe. And he was doing stand up 
And I was like, I'm such a fan of Derek. I'm such a fan of you in Derek, the Ricky yeah. Gervais show. And we hung out for a minute. And then there was this one night where I was at a bar in Hollywood and somebody who looked like Brett came in and sat down at the bar. I was like, I'm just going to tweet at him. And I said, are you at a bar in Hollywood? And it was so funny to see him. And he's like with a group of people and looks down at his phone and then goes, where are you? <laughs> I was like, that is him. <laughs> and then I went and hung out. And uh, he is so nice. He was in development with AMC at the same time that we were for a project of his. Um, and he's just the most humble and kind person and supportive of me when I was a nobody. Um, yeah, I really like that guy a lot. And he yeah. plays such a hard ass in the show. It's amazing. Well, yes, but of course, what you discover as, as the show goes on is that there's a lot more going on underneath. And actually, he's a complete softy. If you know how to draw it's perfect. that out. He's, yeah. he's absolutely terrific. The way they've developed that character is beautiful. He's got so many fans. Yeah. We all love him. So. <laughs> Good.